Okay, so um, as I said, uh, we are going to talk about the general stuff about the lab books themselves, because <clears throat> you have a huge problem with this fulfillment of the required stuff for the lab book. And of course, it will help you a lot uh, during your work in a real research lab. Okay, so I am going to start with the hypothesis and aims, uh, although we also have the title that we need to touch. So why hypothesis and aims? Because these are actually the main parts of any lab, uh, lab notebook, lab report, article, or research project proposal, etc. So what we have here now uh, is the main idea why you actually do some experiment, you conduct some experiment, okay? So this hypothesis is something that orchestrates everything in your project, everything in your experiment. So um, in general, we have the research project. And of course, this research project tests some kind of hypothesis. This is, okay, so while testing this hypothesis, you are performing some set of experiments. Experiment one, experiment two, experiment three and four. Okay, so for every single experiment here, you will have a lab book. Okay, so LB, LB and LB. So why you would want them? Because every single experiment tests some kind of part, uh, some part of the hypothesis and uh, when we talk about testing, it means that we create kind of sub hypothesis for every single exp uh, experiment here. Okay. So uh, now we are going to talk about how to write this lab book. But of course, you can extrapolate it to your project report, lab report, or article. Okay, so this everything uh, could be extrapolated there. So uh, if you understand how it works on the level of lab book, you will for sure know how it works everywhere else. And actually, if you uh, download any, um, any article from, let's say, PubMed and read it, you will see that the outline or the plan of the article is the same as in lab book. Okay, so now, since we focus on this lab book, Let's start with it. So, as I said, uh, every single experiment here tests some part or some side of the main hypothesis of the whole project, okay? So this testing is made on some kind of assumption. And for, for a single experiment, this assumption is your hypothesis of the current experiment. And in our case, it's experiment one. So it is going to be the hypothesis number one, two, okay? So this is the assumption that something is working in this particular way, okay? So uh, since I am taking the enzymes project here, uh, enzymes uh, experiments, uh, we will be talking about the hypothesis on the enzymes. So what uh, you are going to show here in your hypothesis is that uh, conditions, so what might be an, a hypothesis here? The hypothesis might be like conditions in which we perform testing of uh, rate of reaction, um, play a huge role. which means that they are very crucial. I mean, the very uh, nice setup of the conditions is very crucial for a proper uh, conduct conduction of this particular experiment. So this is your hypothesis, okay? I've seen a lot um, in your lab books that the hypothesis is actually um, changing temperature, then concentration, then pH, 
is affecting uh, enzyme rate of reaction. So this actually looks like the aim. Um, you need to find much more fundamental concept here for your hypothesis. So what is hypothesis is some kind of um, fundamental concept that you actually claim, okay? When you claim this fundamental uh, concept, you then have to define some uh, aims to reach the proof of this particular assumption or claim, okay? So let me remove some part which we don't need anymore. Okay, so uh, again, this looks more like aim, uh, much more kind of broad and fundamental part here would be this condition in which we perform the test of reaction rate play a huge role in the enzyme conversion of substrate into product. And then you say, to test this hypothesis, we aim first to test uh, the effect of temperature. Second, the effect of pH. Third, the aim, uh, the effect of enzyme concentration. And finally, the effect of uh, substrate concentration. Okay, so you have four aims and these all uh, four aims, they actually target this very common and general hypothesis that is related to any type of condition. Okay, so it's external conditions that are uh, affecting the, the, the function of this particular enzyme. And then in aims, again, to test or to prove this hypothesis, we aim to test effect of temperature, of pH, of enzyme concentration, and of substrate concentration. Of course, uh, one another aim would be first define uh, normal conditions. because we need some kind of standard to uh, compare the results of these four aims to, okay? So you find a normal or standard condition uh, reaction rate, and then you compare everything else to this reaction rate. And of course, in this case, because now you are talking about the uh, relatedness of uh, the results from these four aims to your standard condition, because you have this relatedness, you will be able to compare it, okay? So um, let's cover it again. So we have, we have the main part, which is hypothesis, and it is fundamental. And also we have aims, and these aims are dependent on hypothesis. So uh, again, why they are dependent? Because with these aims, you are going to prove the hypothesis or test the hypothesis, okay? So here you have details. And these details, they will actually unwrap um, the, the discovery of, uh, well, un unwrap the principle or the concept that underlies this hypothesis, okay? So again, aims are dependent on hypothesis. Okay, so uh, I will tell the dependency tree of the whole experiment uh, on the next slide, but for now, let's uh, focus on hypothesis and aims. So I did not see, uh, well, uh, after, after, after marking um, and reading your um, lab books, I've seen many experiments without hypo, um, hypothesis and aims. So you just skip this part. Uh, this is absolutely impossible because the whole experiment is um, uncovering the hypothesis and its 
importance. Okay. So if you don't have hype or a hypothesis or aims, you don't have an experiment. So please remember that. Even if you are just trying some kind of, uh, let's say you had a cellar bio bias. Okay, so this cellar bias was bought from, let's say, uh, Merck company. Okay, and you also have another cellar bias that comes from um, in vitrogen. Okay, so you have two enzymes. Uh, from two manufacturers. If you want to test which one is better for your uh, for your experiments, this is also an experiment, okay? And within this experiment, the hypothesis would be one enzyme from an, uh, from let's say Merck is better than the enzyme from Invitrogen. Okay, so this is your hypothesis and you are going to test it. So how you test it, you perform some experiments on the conversion of substrate to product. This is your aim. And you see that uh, this particular experiment has, first of all, hypothesis and then aim. So, okay, so uh, if you, um, if you say that you perform some kind of experiment, you absolutely have to have hypothesis and aims. And if I don't see these hypothesis and aims in the um, rest of your lab books, you will get zero mark here. For now, because you didn't have these feedbacks uh, from the start of semester, I will be uh, taking it easy. But uh, for your proteomics project, proteomics, project, uh, you will absolutely have to have hypothesis and aims for every single week, because every single week is an experiment, okay, that you need to conduct. Okay, so what else you need to, to, to have? Uh, so it is about wording, okay, so how you formulate your hypothesis and your aims. I've seen lots of you who actually touched the hypothesis and aims, uh, lots of you try to show it in a very beautiful way. Uh, beautiful does not always mean good, okay? Because uh, I'm pretty sure that in your high school, you were taught to show um, more words than you actually need to show, okay? So um, we all know about those uh, word limits, word count limits. So this is not about your lab book because your lab book is for yourself and for your friends, your peers, so for co-workers in the lab, and they don't want, and believe me, you also don't want to read all those um, general stuff that is not actually related to this particular experiment. So make it concise, and in this concise mean uh, all details, details without mm, non-needed stuff and concise does not mean one word so for 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 some cases concise might mean actually four sentences and for another case it might mean four words and it's never one single word and i also see saw it in your um, answers so some people uh, on the question of describe uh, how P glow allows glowing or something like that. Um, they just write GFP and they think that it is a concise, uh, complete answer. This is not, you get zero here, guys, zero mark. Why? Because it does not describe in uh, how the P glow actually allows for glowing. Okay. So concise means all details possible without unneeded stuff. Okay, so it also means that you avoid general wording uh, just to reach the word count limit. Again, your lab book is for yourself because in future, 
you come to this lab. So let's say you are in PhD. And uh, while you, you do your doctorate, you need to come uh, to the first lab um, of the project. Okay, so you have four year project. And whenever uh, when you start writing thesis for this project on the fourth year, you are coming back to the first year, first year lab book. And from this lab book, you need to actually extract information. And the only way to extract it efficiently is not using general words, using all details possible and showing hypotheses and aims for every single uh, experiment that you, you that you conducted. Because in this way, uh, you are set. Uh, you don't have to um, repeat the experiments just to obtain uh, the results for these particular hypotheses and aims, et cetera, et cetera. So when you are in the process of writing the lab book, you are actually helping yourself, but in future, okay? So this is very important. Okay, so what else you need to know here? Mm. This. Okay, so what else you need to know here is that uh, hypothesis uh, and aims, they define the whole plan of the experiment. Okay, so they really do um, set up uh, the, the project itself. So you have hypothesis as level zero, okay? So please remember this is level zero. Um, this is the most fundamental part of your experiment. Hypothesis has one dependent and this dependent is aims section. So this is your level one, okay? So uh, these aims, they are um, dependence of the hypothesis. So the hypothesis defines aims and the aims, they define protocol or in our case methods. And also they define title, title of your uh, experiment. So this is level two. Why they define protocol? Because you are aiming some uh, tests for your hypothesis. And let's say that within your aims, you have testing of temperature effect on enzyme. Because you have this aim, you of course choose the protocol that is appropriate for testing uh, the effect of temperature on the enzyme. You don't choose PCR here, right? So you don't choose the protocol for PCR while you are testing the effect of temperature on the enzyme activity. So that's why aims, they define the protocol. <clears throat> How do they define the title? So again, when you are on the fourth year of your studies and you need to go back to your first year, and let's say that all four years you were um, studying the enzymes, okay? And if your title is enzyme uh, and enzyme one, then the second title is enzyme two, enzyme three, etc. So you don't have a good titling of your uh, experiments here. So what does it mean? It actually means that um, by the fourth year time, uh, by, by, well, on the fourth year of your PhD studies, you might actually have 10 lab books. And because these four years you were doing the research on enzymes, every single experiment is named enzyme. And you actually need to go to a, a project, uh, an experiment that was aiming to show uh, to show, um, let's say the, the conversion of glucose into aldehyde, okay? And you don't remember actually, what was the number of that particular lab? You don't remember what was the number of this particular experiment, which means you will have to go through every single lab in every single lab book until you reach 
this particular experiment. That's why the aims, they define the title. So again, you help yourself in future. So what would be a very good way to do, um, to do titling? If you only work on, uh, on the enzymes the whole time, uh, you don't need to write something like enzymes and then period and then uh, glucose to aldehyde conversion using the enzyme one. This might be a very good explanation of this particular experiment. And if you actually think of your future version of you, then you will do some kind of uh, some kind of explanation of what was done during that time. I'm not talking about dating, so uh, putting date here and time because it's obvious. I'm talking about the title itself. So if you know that all your work was in enzymes, then you actually might avoid uh, this first part before the period. You can actually say that you were uh, looking at the glucose to aldehyde uh, conversion here. Okay, so this is the dependent of the aims and the protocol is also the dependent of the aims. So um, this is level two. Now we have the level three. And on level three, we actually have uh, also two players. So first one is materials and second is results. So why materials are dependent on the protocol? Oh, well, uh, these two players or two nodes, they are dependent on the protocol. Okay, so protocol has some effect on materials and results. So why materials? Because if your protocol is to, mm, again, test temperature effect on enzyme, you are not choosing master mix for PCR. That's why uh, the, 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 the protocol defines all the materials that are used within um, the, the time frame of this particular experiment. So how do results depend on the protocol? Well, the protocol is actually just a written instruction, instruction for the whole experiment or for the obtaining of results, which means that they are, I mean, the results are direct dependence of these, uh, of these protocols, okay? So this is level three. Now we have level four and on level four, we have discussion. And the discussion is the dependent of the results. Okay, so without results, we will not have any discussion. And again, uh, you could only do that if you have all other layers or levels set up in a very appropriate way, okay? And of course, this everything should be going into your lab book. So you cannot just avoid protocol because without protocol, you will not be able to assess uh, the, the righteous um, usage of materials and you will not be able to understand what results you received from, from, from the experiment because the protocol is defining the results. The same goes here. Uh, without discussion, without results, you will not be able to write any discussion. So let's say you uh, don't write any results. So what do you discuss within this section? What conclusions you make in this section? What outliers, etc. Okay, so uh, this is level four. And finally, we have level five. And on level five, we have conclusion. And this conclusion is the dependent of discussion. And within this conclusion, you are actually comparing uh, what you received, all your thoughts, etc., to the hypothesis and aims, okay? So this is the lowest uh, level of this structure. And it is only made for comparison between the conclusion or 
what was in the end of the whole experiment and you compare it to what was the initial part of the experiment okay that's why again aims because um, they come from the hypothesis they define the plan the protocol and of course the results through the protocol okay so this is about the importance of hypothesis and aims and again um, from this week on i expect you all write the hypothesis and aims in your lab books if you don't do that you get zero marks for this particular uh, section this is very important okay so um, the problem of the title uh, as i said uh, it should explain what the experiment is about okay since it is related to the aims uh, just write them down in the pro uh, in the title so i've seen lots of enzyme one and two titles in your lab books they explain nothing okay so for enzyme one you could write something like defining standard curve and uh, standard uh, initial rate of reaction So this might be a very good, um, a very good title for your first lab. For your second lab, you could some uh, could write something like testing pH, temperature, and concentration effects on enzyme activity. Why again? When you come back to this lab book uh, in a few years time, you will thank yourself for having these titles. It didn't take much time to write it, but it will help lots uh, to avoid a needless kind of scanning through the whole lab book in the future. So general convention is that you use active voice. So uh, you want to show some kind of verb in your title why you want this verb like defining or testing is to show the act that was made so you can you, uh, for for this particular lab you could write something like ph temperature and concentration effect and that's it does it tell you much no it actually does not show you what you were aiming here and aiming was testing enzyme activity also if you see the titles that say you nothing it means that the person actually did not spend my, much time uh, for attracting people to the article or to the love book okay you need to come up with a very good titling of your experiment or lab report or article just because you want people to hear you and they do hear you after they read the article and if i well most of the time when you scan through the lists of articles you actually assess them based on the title sometimes again sometimes i see very catchy titles and even though i don't need to wrote, uh, to read those i go and read just because a person was able to catch my attention and you need to be that person because you are doing lots of work in the lab you are doing lots of research and you want to uh, actually speak or talk and tell about your experiment otherwise your whole project was in vain okay so please do try <clears throat> writing or naming your uh, lab books in active voice from from today so that by the end of uh, of your bachelor's degree you are very good at titling your work it will help you in future because again i've seen many people of postdoc level who just don't know how to name their um, their work and they lose the points there okay so 
no one is interested in their work. So if you do practice now, um, it will be easy for you in the future. So again, you help yourself in the future. So this is about the title. I talked about um, the hypothesis and the aims. <clears throat> now let's switch to the materials and methods. And also we will talk about the pre and post loss. So uh, methods is the level two of your um, lab book organization or any actual academic writing organization. And materials, they are dependent on these uh, methods, okay? So what we want you to do, mm, use paragraph text. Lots of you wrote something like first step, second step, third step, fourth step, etc. This takes much space in your work. Um, again, you actually aim to keep the attention of the person. If the person sees lots of, let's say this is your um, page here, and person sees lots of uh, sentences and lots of white space, they actually see it as a very bad side, uh, sign, okay? Why? Because it means that the person did not spend much time to actually care about their readers. Why is caring about readers? Because you want to spend your time effectively. So if you write the same um, order of the protocol written in paragraph text, it will be taking very small um, amount of uh, sentences. And the paragraph is very small. And instead of going through every single um, step here, they just read a small paragraph and they are left with the general understanding of what happened during the uh, experiment. So how the experiment was done, okay? Well, if you read this whole uh, list, ordered list of the steps, you actually might lose the attention here somewhere and you, uh, with losing attention, you lose interest in reading this work, okay? So your first and main goal is to keep attention of the reader. Be this reader you or somebody else, doesn't really matter. So keep the attention of the reader. Okay, so the materials are the same. So write them in one paragraph. So materials, write them here. Don't write them like one, two, three, etc., etc. So for the conciseness, again, um, some of you think that if you give, give one word, it will be enough. No, it means that you, you are giving the incomplete answer and incomplete is as bad as incorrect. Well, actually it is incorrect, okay? And concise does not mean incomplete. Concise means all details without um, unnecessary words. Make sure that you know what it is and um, you will be all right if you understand that concise is not incomplete. So for your pre and post lab questions, again, I've seen lots of examples when people just think that single yes word is enough to explain the, the question. So. Uh, why we actually give you these questions, why we want you to answer those questions is not to read one single word. It is actually to see your way of thinking, to see how you approach a problem and how you actually deal with this problem, okay? So if, you, if we ask you something, please spend some time to explain what, uh, what you think about these questions, etc. Okay, so this is about the materials and methods part. Now let's switch to the next le level. So the results. The results are related to the aims again, and they are related to aims through the protocol. So, well, actually in, uh, in the first slides, I shown um, two, three, four, five, five aims. <clears throat> the fifth one was building 
uh, standard curve and standard initial rate of reaction. So these guys, they are related to the same small experiment. So let's call it sub-experiment, okay? Um, the fourth one was about the enzyme concentration, uh, the substrate concentration, then the pH and uh, the temperature. Okay, so if you look at these aims, they actually explain or require uh, separate experiments. And these separate experiments, they require separate protocols uh, because you cannot use the uh, enzyme concentration protocol to test the temperature, right? And also it means that they will be belonging to different parts of the results because results, they explain the sub-experiments Sub experiment one, sub experiment two, three, four, and five. You cannot combine them in one single graph or figure. Uh, they even might need to go in different tables. Okay. So please make sure that you understand that every sub experiment is related to its particular separate aim. And because the aims are separated, your results also need to be separated. So uh, if you read the articles, sometimes you see something like results, and then you have a small subsection here calling, uh, called like temperature effect on enzyme. So this small subheading actually tells you that we have approach to the first aim of the experiment. And then we have text, some graph, et cetera, et cetera. And this, this is related to the first subsection, to the first aim, okay? Never um, put them in the same graphs, etc. because, well, not never, but almost never, you, you should be putting those uh, results into the same uh, graph, etc. So separate them not to mess up the whole experiment, because if it is messy, then you will not be able to adequately extract the thoughts, the conclusions, etc. Okay, so the problem of textual support of the tables, figures, and graphs. Texts are very important. Why? Because in your graph, so let's say this graph is actually showing the standard curve. Okay, so you have 12, 20, and 100. Okay, so this graph shows um, the, the dependency of absorbance on the concentration, okay? So what you actually have here is the graph that explains it, but uh, you don't show any other information that was obtained during this particular experiment because you don't have the textual information that supports it. So what I would suggest you do is first of all, title your graph or your table or figure. And of course, uh, the title should be explaining what you see. If you just leave it as uh, graph one, believe me, no one, including you yourself in future, will understand what is this dependency? What is this concentration? Concentration of what? then what was the absorption, etc. So how and why they are dependent on each other. And if you write something like graph one, standard curve for P nitrophenol, mm, concentration um, shown in absorbance um, units. This will explain everything, okay? But more than that, you will have to have some text that uh, also tells some details about this graph. Something like used concentrations, 12.5, uh, 25, 50, 100. These small details, they might include actually the outliers. And if they include outliers, the person who reads this text, they will understand that they need to go back to this graph and find out this outlier. And if they do uh, find it out, they will um, kind of, they will be much more involved 
in the reading of this article. And it's not only about reading this article, but it's also about the understanding of this article. Because this outlier, uh, although you, you think that it is outlier, somebody might think that it is actually a very valid value. And because it's valid, they can repeat your experiment and find a better explanation for the presence of this particular value here. Okay, so um, as I said during every single uh, laboratory that we had, so the, uh, the science as well as education is about sharing. It's not about competi competition, it's about sharing. So you share your knowledge with people around you or with yourself in future. And this sharing is only possible when you give most, like all possible details. And when you give these details, you expect somebody to go through those details, which means that textual information is very important. Also, there is some, uh, some kind of relatedness to the types of people. So some people like visual content, some like textual content or audio context, so content. So it really depends on the person. And if they don't see textual information, it means that you lost those readers. And if you lost them, they actually might contribute to your research by pointing out that this is actually not an outlier. And because this is not an outlier, of course, the result is changed. And because it's changed, the whole understanding of the experiment might change. So never underestimate the textual information because it gives the most of the details, okay? Uh, so this is about the results, uh, about the textual information that is supporting uh, the, uh, the, the graphical information. Well, most probably when you go to other laboratories, you will, you will hear that the tables, figures, and graphs are actually supporting the text, which is also valid because, uh, again, it depends on the person. If they like textual information more, they will say that tables and figures, they support the text. I like uh, tables and figures more. That's why I say textual information is actually supporting the, the tables and figures. Okay, so this is about the results. Now let's talk about the discussion. Okay, so what is discussion? Uh, everyone loves the discussion. Why? Because here in this particular section, you explain everything. So before, in the results section, you were only um, showing what you received and you never say anything about why you received these results, why you obtained them. So if you see an outlier here, you don't say something like, uh, it might have happened, et cetera, et cetera, because this is troubleshooting and troubleshooting is belonging to the discussion section, okay? So all the thoughts, all the troubleshooting, all the um, conclusion about uh, these uh, results, they come to the discussion. Uh, here you have pure um, dry declaration of results. Okay, so in the discussion again, you are yourself. Okay, so you give the explanation of outliers, problems, and thoughts on every single sub experiment, if they actually support your hypothesis, if they actually disprove it. So this everything goes into discussion. So really it's the most interesting part of the of the whole work because here um, on one side you give the thoughts explain the problems etc and on the other side is a reader who could actually agree with you on your thoughts on your problems uh, trouble troubleshooting etc or they can disagree and because you have this contact uh, they can email you asking for more details, for more thoughts, or maybe for correcting your thoughts. So this is actually the discussion is um, the section for interaction with the reader. And here 
you explain everything. So sometimes you might see something like results and uh, discussion. Don't do that. Uh, well, we ask you to separate them. And why we ask to do that? Because separation of results and discussions teach you to approach, again, approach these pure dry declaration of results and separate it from your thoughts. It actually makes it tidy, the whole work, ordered, ordered, and also it makes it much more understandable. for you and for the people who read it. Okay, so um, one particular uh, journal might actually ask you to combine them. And because you know how to separate them, you, you also know how to combine them. But if you only know how to combine these results and discussion, you will not be able to separate them. And I will tell you, most of the journals, they ask to separate it because this separation actually shows how serious you are about your research. So uh, actually the person who also works on the same enzymes somewhere in Africa, they can actually disregard your discussion and only use the results, etc. Then they come up with, a, with their own discussion and compare it to your discussion, okay? But if you gave it in a single, uh, section, of course, they lose the chance to give their own opinion on the results. So that's why we ask you to separate those. If you do separate and you know how to do that, if you practice a lot from today, you will be doing it very, very fast, very, very easily. And actually, um, people like that are welcomed in the labs because again, not everyone, not every single researcher knows how to do that. And sometimes they actually ask for feedback. And let's say that you received uh, one colleague's work, so be it article, and they actually ask you to give a kind of review on this article. And you say like, separate results and the discussion. And of course it, 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 of course, it makes you um, much more important for that person because your review is very valuable. And of course, they see that you are experienced. You know how the things are uh, written. You know how to approach the problem. And that's why you will be a valuable member of the team because you know what to look at and you know how to address it. Okay, so this is the discussion part. Again, all your thoughts, all the uh, explanations of the problems, troubleshooting and everything else goes to your discussion. So this is opinion on the results. And you absolutely have to have it. There is no experiment with, without the discussion because if you don't have discussion, and you just declared the results, then what's the purpose of the whole work? What's the purpose of me reading it if you don't have your own thoughts? What if I'm not an expert in this field? I actually expect you as an expert, show these uh, thoughts, etc. show your expertise, okay? And that's why discussion, well, every single section is really important but most of all is your discussion hypothesis and aims because hypothesis and aims they define the whole experiment okay finally we have the conclusion so i also seen lots of lab books without conclusion at all uh, so what is conclusion conclusion is the part where you compare the aims and hypothesis to the actual experiment and what we received in the end. So it's like discussion. So you compare the discussion and the hypothesis. So when you set up the aims and hypothesis, you actually predict something. Something. Okay, so these predicted results, um, they stay in this section. 
And now you have the actual results, discussion, and understanding of what we received and why we received that. So now you clash them and you see how the predictions were predicting the real experiment outcomes. If they did, then your hypothesis is proven. Is proven. And because it's proven, you made a really good job by suggesting these hypotheses, okay? Which means, again, your whole work is very valuable. Okay, so another part might be that your hypothesis is actually not proven or disproven. It is also a good uh, result. Why? Because it means that you don't need to spend much time to disprove it again and again. You already know that it does not work. You just try to find another way to approach the problem. And you are valuable member of the team in both of these uh, cases. Why? Because you could identify the uh, value of these hypotheses. Sometimes people, they just don't understand how to compare hypotheses and expected results to the actual experiment. And they actually write something like, we proved everything and everything went smooth, etc. But while you read this article, you understand that they didn't. And of course, it means that um, they are not much valuable people. They are not, not much valuable researchers. So don't be such person. Know how to compare stuff. And even if you love this hypothesis, okay? So this is something that you cherished for, for a long time. If it is not proven, if it is shown to be false, you have to get rid of it with no kind of sentiments, with no, with no mercy, etc. Because this is science, this is how it's done. If you have the strength to um, actually admit that your hypothesis did not work, it means that you are an open-minded person who allows the corrections, etc., etc. So this is why conclusion is very important. You have the results and the discussion, and you compare them to the aims and hypothesis. If, again, if they match, you are okay. If they don't match, you are okay. So don't think that if your hypothesis did not work, you just spend time in vain. No, you actually defined, mm, defined one case that does, does not work. And it means that you don't need to spend much more time to find uh, if this hypothesis is actually working, but with these and these conditions. Okay, so just get rid of it and move on, that's it. So this is about the conclusion. So why it's so important, just because it shows how, oops. It shows how much you are, uh, Okay, so how much you are uh, interested in sharing the knowledge, in discussing the knowledge, etc. Okay, by the way, um, because we touched these expected results in your aims, so sometimes when you read uh, the articles, um, you might see something like introduction. And within this introduction, usually the last paragraph, you see the hypothesis and the aims. And for the aims, you might see something like expected results. This is very usual uh, results for uh, lab reports and for lab books. So you expect something, you write it straight away, and then you compare it to your discussion. So if you see these expected results, don't be afraid, this is something usual. And also please use it all the time because it is actually um, the proof that you understand the topic in a way that you can predict how the organism will behave uh, in these conditions. Okay, so let's say that you are testing the temperature. 
So uh, you have the aim to test temperature effect on enzyme. And you actually have an expected result. And you expect that uh, the enzyme will work fine until 37 Celsius degrees. And at 42 Celsius degrees, it will uh, go down very, I mean, the, the, the activity of these enzyme will go down very, very steep. But in fact, so this is your expected result. In fact, what you see is that uh, the enzyme is increasing its activity uh, up to 60 Celsius degrees. And it actually tells you that the experiment that you've done is really different to your expected results. And it actually means that you have some kind of blank spot, blank space in your knowledge. So you actually need to write, uh, read something more about how enzymes work. So you have expected results. And when you do um, similar, uh, when, you do, when you conduct similar experiment next time, you will be already expecting some other results than dropping of activity at 42 Celsius degrees. And these new expected results, they will be much closer to the reality. Okay, so here, uh, hypothesis, aims, and expected results. This is predictions. Predictions. And your discussion and results, this is reality. And now you compare them, if they match or, or not matching. Okay, so reality versus predictions. This is how the, the science works. <clears throat> Now let's talk about the general problems that I've seen during the marking. So for example, here, um, you can see that uh, the person who was doing this particular uh, um, experiment, so they defined um, the, 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 uh, the function for this particular line. So this line is actually uh, showing the behavior of linear behavior of this um, graph. So first of all, when we talk about the concentration, so here we have absorption, and we talk about the concentration. First of all, if at zero point, we don't match zero concentration, so zero absorbance means zero concentration. If it is going below zero, it means that we have negative concentration here. So in our universe, in the universe that you live in, there is nothing like negative concentration. So what is negative concentration? It is minus one mole of substance in one liter. So how do you reach one, minus one mole? Is it even possible? No, of course it's not. That's why you need to get rid of uh, the intercept here. It should be equal to zero so that your graph, the line, trend, trend line, starts at zero when we have zero uh, x value here. <clears throat> x value here. Okay? And it's only possible when you don't have this intercept. So in this case, you have the general linear regression, which is y equal y, uh, ax plus b. So this is depend, uh, independent variable. This is dependent variable. Here we have a, and here we have intercept. OK, so at 0x, you should be having 0y for many, many experiments. So you need to define it first, which ones are um, mm, mm, which ones are given zero when it's zero x value. For concentration, of course it is, because there is nothing like negative concentration. Okay, so it's only possible, so this y equal to zero only then and then when x is equal to zero, which means that uh, we don't care about this a here, and we should equalize this b to zero too. 
So this is the statistical part and you will be doing lots of statistics during your uh, bachelor's degree. So from now on, please pay attention to this intercept. If the experiment requires you to equalize uh, the independent variable to zero to obtain zero in the dependent uh, variable, then you get rid of this intercept. Also, uh, what was not okay here? Uh, of course, you have the mm, good naming of the axis, so amount of p nitrophenol in nanomoles. Okay, so here you have 12.5, 25, 50, and 100. So what is not okay here? Uh, I am, um, I don't feel fine with the ranges between these points. You understand that between 100 and 50, you have 50 nanomoles. Between 50 and 25, you have 25. Between 25 and 12.5, you have 20. 12.5 but on the graph they look the same so 50 is not equal to 25 and is not equal to 12.5 which means here you use not point graph you actually use the scattered plot, uh, graph and scattered graph shows 12.5 here then 25 here 50 here and 100 somewhere here. So the range or the distance between these two um, points is really reflecting the, the difference between them in numbers. And of course, in this case, instead of having this funky curved um, graph, you will have almost straight line here, straight away. And because uh, you made it in a very inappropriate way. You obtain uh, the explanation of this trend line mm, that does not reflect the reality, okay? That's why, again, uh, w when you talk about some kind of measure units that are, uh, that are showing some kind of, again, measures, and they don't show the time points, etc. You absolutely have to use these scattered plot, scattered graph, with the saving of these distances between the, the between the points. So this is one second here. So uh, what is what is this graph showing us? It actually shows something in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30. What are these axes? Why it starts right here? Uh, what is this graph? Where is the legend? Uh, so what it shows? Only one thing that we have is the naming of it, which tells you that it is about the amount, <clears throat> the amount of the amount of p nitrophenol change over time. Okay, it says nothing because what is what? Is this absorbance, uh, concentration, um, like minutes? What else? Um, minutes, days, or whatever. And what about these guys too? So you need to pay attention to what you want to show. If you, again, if you show something incomplete, it means that it is incorrect. Please make sure that you complete the task. Okay, so next point here is again about this intercept. So because it is showing you much, um, you are obtaining negative results for your um, uh, concentration. You cannot have negative concentration in our universe. It is impossible. So that's why pay attention to what happens in your formula that explains this trend line. Finally, here again, the same problem. So uh, we cannot have uh, the concentrations below zero. If you have this in your calculation, you just equalize it to zero. That's it.
uh, about the MB1 lab. So there we were talking about the uh, osmosis. So um, the incorrect way to show osmosis is to combine every single result from different aims to a single uh, graph. So what we actually have here, we have rising mass and then it suddenly drops to zero and then it goes below um, in negative values. It actually explains three different um, experiments. So don't make this mistake because this experiment is not related to this experiment, okay? Also here we have an outlier and this outlier, it will screw your uh, sample here. So if you have this random value contributing to your discussion, it means that your hypothesis is not uh, proven. It means that you have a rubbish hypothesis. So um, don't make this mistake. So I will send a video that explains why it's not proving the, the hypothesis or disproving the hypothesis and how to get rid of it. And it is, it's actually easy. When you define the outlier, you just remove it. So, okay, so what is the correct way to show the experiment is to identify the experiments that you have. So the first experiment here uh, is shown on this graph. And this explains uh, the, the change of mass uh, with the glucose inside the bag. And we put these bags into water in water, in water. So this is a single experiment. Now we have the second experiment about water in water, sorry, water in water. Finally, we have the third experiment, which is water uh, in glucose. So technically we have three different experiments. That's why we need to have three different graphs. Okay, so, uh, uh, I would accept that you show um, these second and third sub experiments in the same graph because water in water is actually showing the um, no change of mass. And this no change of mass might be shown as 100% of the, of the mass change. So here we have 100 minus 5 is 95, then 90, 85, 80, uh, 75, 70, 60, 60, uh, 65, and 60. So this is the, um, the drop of the mass in the experiments where we use the water in some kind of medium. So for the first point, it is water in water. For all three others, it's water in glucose. Okay, so because we removed the outlay here, you see that your graphs kind of uh, getting very close to each other. And it means that they, I mean, your experiment is almost um, giving you almost the same results as the experiments of other groups. And it might mean actually that your hypothesis is proven is proven to be uh, correct, okay? So I think this is the end.